worth. This book has been the book in my family or in my aunt and uncle's uh, terminology for quite a while. He expected to write his own autobiography, and so they had these tremendous archives documenting so much of what they did up there. And uh, when I went up to see her, they opened up the door of the archives, and it was a bottom storage room under a three three bay garage up in Anchor Point, Alaska, where they had their house and their their uh, office, the medical office that they'd built there in the 70s. And it was overwhelming. And uh, they had a, st uh, a um, patient register about that thick, 57, 58,000 patients of uh, one man's medical practice for 50 years or so. He wasn't able to complete his autobiography. He worked longer than he expected to, and it was just too overwhelming. And it had different ideas about how to approach it, but one with a medical researcher who was totally professional and had done this for a friend of his, and it was just too expensive. She would have to stay there for too long, living with them, basically, to go through things. And uh, so she knew my background, and I'd done an oral history of my uncle at that point, which we sort of... Um, I think I stepped on her toes a little bit when I did that oral history. And uh, we had a little bit of frostiness before that. And then when I went up to see her, all that disappeared eventually. It was in the, it's in the book about how that uh, unwound. And she said at one point, she said, you do it. You tell Milo's story. And it was very important to him and to her to have his story out there. And it was very important to me. When I went up there when I was 16, I knew it was a fabulous story. And, and it's a great story by any, any stretch of the imagination. It's a hero's story. And I, when I was up there, I kept notes. I had a journal every day. I took a lot of photographs. I kept all my correspondence. So beyond the archives that I saw up in Alaska, I had my own. My family ended up having, having more, even more. And uh, that was all part of the mix. And that was the big problem for me was I said yes, just to say yes. And then, then how do you deal with all this material? <laughs> He was this, first of all, very witty, brilliant, um, bigger than life kind of figure. When I was a young girl, he'd sort of sweep into town. He was uh, visiting outside Philadelphia. We lived in Marion, Pennsylvania, and he'd come in periodically out of Alaska for medical conferences. He was the president of the Alaska Medical Association, and he would just come in and be this, this huge presence. And he would also write, he and my father had a correspondence. They were brothers of three years apart. My father was a little bit younger. And they had this correspondence. So we had a sense of his life as they both ha happily wrote typewritten letters back and forth to each other once a week. So we had a very good idea of what his life was going on. We didn't see every letter because some of them were too personal or too confidential maybe. But the letters, certain letters would get posted regularly on our refrigerator for us to read or not as children growing up. And so I had a sense of him, him that way. But he was just an amazing person. Just a My father was interested in going to Alaska, living in Greenwich Village, had, had run into Stephenson, who was a great Arctic explorer, who used to talk and, and live and talk in, in New York City. And so he got very enamored with Alaska. And then my uncle went up from Duke University where he was doing his residency in eye, ear, nose, and throat residency there and visited my father and there was a big picture of Alaska on the wall, there was a lot of material on his desk and he just started looking it over and he saw the territorial governor's report on Alaska, John Troy's report, and saw how terrible the, condi the medical conditions, the health conditions of the native Alaska natives were. The indigenous populations all over the state have been totally neglected. And this was a report that, among other things, recounted that. And he said, when I'm finished with Duke, that's where I'm going to go. That's where the most need is. He, there was uh, terrible afflictions of the eyes and ears. And he was a newly trained, state-of-the-art, uh, trained eye, ear, nose, and throat specialist. So at that point, he was married to my aunt. They got married while he was in his residency at Duke. And in 1940, they set up, set out from uh, uh, Pelham, New York, and drove across country and ended up in Ketchikan, Alaska, 
and where he answered an ad to be part of a partner a medical practice up in Ketchikan. They needed a specialist, uh, and he fit the bill. And he also done itinerant work when he was at Duke for the North Carolina um, Institute for the Blind. He'd gone out and done these clinics out in poverty-stricken areas. He loved itinerant clinics. He loved going out and seeing the people, seeing the places, and helping. He needed to go out to the, the do the clinics out in the, in the bush areas, but he had to find a mail plane that was going there or something. You know, he depended on other transportation, and then found that was impractical, and and ended up buying his own airplane. Little he called it Slowpoke, the slowest airplane there was, uh, and would begin to, to start the clinics out there and would go out there and, and just land either on the water or on a strip of uh, beach or, or a road and bring medical uh, supplies and whatever he needed to hold these clinics in the in the bush villages all over and uh, he loved and he learned to fly in 19, early 1950s I guess it would and then he was doing that for a number of years. And he got, became known for that, Alaska's Flying Doctor. He would just fly in. And he spent about a third of his time out in the bush, on these bush clinics, um, about 150 of them in all during that. So it was, uh, as he said, it was back-breaking work, but he loved it.